Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. It is good to be in church this morning to all of our friends and uh, visitors that are here today. Guests, we are so glad you're here. My name is Alex, and I'm the lead pastor here at Journey Church, and I've got an incredible guest today. Vicky's in the house. <laughs> Sister Vicky, Miss Vicky, Mrs. Vicky, we're going to call you a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. Mama Vicky, everything. Uh, well, we've got uh, an incredible story we're about to share in just a few moments. But before we get into that, I just want to, again, welcome all of our first-time guests. If you're watching online for the first time, don't leave. Stay right there. If you're on Facebook, don't scroll. Trust me, there's nothing on Instagram for you. Uh, hang out with us right here. I believe what we're going to share is going to be life-changing um, and uh, also, for those of you that are here that are just regular family folks, it's good to see y'all too. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. Now, if you lied, look to heaven and say, Lord, fix me. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure y'all were still awake. Uh, just a few moments ago, we had an opportunity to have five minutes of interaction time, and that's what we like to have. And you probably say, that's a little hard for a person who is not, you know, the huggy, feely, touchy type. And we get it. Um, but we really, I really fully believe that you cannot do faith without community. That, that everything about Christianity is about community. And I know our personality types are different. And some are less touchy and more this and more that. But it's just impossible. I don't know how Jesus traveled with 12 men that long and not, didn't do it in the context of community. So in our services, we love the opportunities just to stop and to do that because I think oftentimes in church, it's usually somebody's talking to you, somebody's singing to you. But really, uh, one of the most important things that happened uh, both during Jesus's ministry and also in the early church was that people were in each other's faces, that fellowship was happening, that we were connecting with one with another. And uh, I had an opportunity to pray for someone during that interaction time. And maybe you did too. Maybe um, someone hugged you. Maybe someone shook your hand. And maybe that was a, that, that, that just connection was everything that you needed for service. I've been told many a times, pastor, the sermon was okay. Uh, but that interaction time, that, that, that saved me this week. That helped keep me alive. And I just want to encourage uh, the church. That fellowship is so important. So important that we're together. It's Palm Sunday. And this is the, yeah, it's Palm Sunday. And you're like, what's Palm Sunday? Well, Palm Sunday marks Jesus' triumphant entry. He's coming into town, and it's the, it, it, is a, it is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And it speaks to him not just being a prophet, but being the Messiah. And what's amazing about this moment for Jesus on Sunday is that everybody is celebrating him. They're taking palms off of trees, laying it at his feet. They're taking their, their garments, their cloaks, and they're laying it at his feet. And they're shouting, Hosanna. I mean, giving him all kinds of praise and accolades. But isn't it just like life? Life turns on a dime, doesn't it? And Jesus on Sunday is getting all the accolades and all the praise. And then by about Wednesday, he ain't nothing but trouble. By Friday, he's hanging on the cross. And I want you to consider that um, this week as we go into what we call Passion or Holy Week. I pray that this will not just be a regular week. You should, you should always do this, but particularly this week, I want to invite you into something. I want you to consider the suffering that your Savior went through for you. And the reason I want you to do that, because I really believe that many of you here are suffering right now. You may be going through your own pain. And we oftentimes wonder, can God really relate to our struggle? Or there's a scripture that says, we don't have a high priest. It's a reference to Jesus who doesn't understand our pain. But we serve the God who sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, who endured pain just like you and I. So when you're praying and you're like, Lord, you don't know what it feels like. He's like, "Uh, -uh I do know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be abandoned. I know what it feels like to be forgotten. I know what it feels like to be pressed on. I know what it feels like to want to burst. So I want to encourage you this week. Why don't you sit in the suffering with our Savior? And as you sit with him in his sufferings, you're going to realize, oh God, help me, that he's been sitting with you and you're suffering the entire time. That you are not alone. That you are not forgotten. Does somebody really believe that? 
How many of you realize that God has never left you and he's never forsaken you and he's with you always? And while you go through the story, while you go through the story, you'll find that he was arrested. You'll find that he was, he was uh, uh, charged and eventually convicted of a crime he didn't even commit. You'll find that there were judges that were responsible for judging him that didn't even want to judge him because they knew he was a righteous and a good man. You'll find that he has to deal with deception. You'll find that in your lowest moments that some of the people you counted on the most will actually hurt you. I'm preaching real good now. That there's a Judas and there's a Peter. You, you, you'll learn that sometimes in your most difficult moment that you have to learn to sit at a table with someone who wants to hurt you. And you have to smile and love them anyway. And you'll learn that all through the pain and through the suffering that God is always present. Let me tell you what happened to Jesus. The father never forsook him, never turned his face from him, but was with him even in the agonizing pain. Now, I'll share this last part. We'll get into today's story because, you know, I got to be a pastor today. Oh, yeah. Mama Vicky, Always. I got to be a pastor. Let me say this to you. God is going to invite you into moments of suffering. He invited his three closest disciples into a time of prayer during the most agonizing moments of his life. And what did they do, y'all? Can I just give you a quick word? Don't fall asleep. God is inviting you into a place of suffering, and it is so tempting. It is so natural to want to sleep. And I don't mean a physical sleep. I mean a spiritual sleep. I want to encourage you to stay awake. Because it may be painful right now, but turn to your neighbor and say, Sunday's coming. I'm going to say that again until somebody gets that in their spirit. It may be Wednesday right now, but turn to your neighbor and say, say Sunday's coming. I'm talking to your future week now. It may be Thursday right now. Tell them, say Sunday's coming. It's Friday, three o'clock. It is finished. Everything has left him. His body is laying. It, it's hanging lifeless on the cross. But remind the enemy that Sunday is coming. Wait, 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 church, where are y'all at? Sunday is coming. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, he won't stay dead. But early Sunday morning, they'll go see about his body, and they'll see that he has gotten up out of the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. Come on, somebody. He got up with all power in his hand. I want to declare this over you right now. Because Jesus got up, you can get up too. Because Jesus got up, you can get up out of that bed of depression. You can get up out of that bed of sickness. Because Jesus got up, you can have life too. I want to speak that over you. Because some of you came in here so heavy and so overwhelmed and so burdened by life. I want to let you know that Christ is in it with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. If you receive that word, give the Lord the biggest hand praise you've got. Come on, if you receive it, give it to him. Come on, give him a, a thundering applause. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. All right. I want to uh, kind of bring you into a series that we're in, and we launched it last week. And how many of you enjoyed last week's story with joy? If you guys have been following on social media, Joy made a comment about my legs being really short, and I was a little crushed about that. If you didn't, go, go to my social media page, you'll see. And I want to let y'all know, we didn't live stream it, but Joy and I played one-on-one. -on -one. I beat her 7 nothing. Um, I wish we had a camera to show y'all that. You've got to watch last week's. Now you're like, I don't even know what he's talking about. I'm setting this up so that you'll get on our app or our YouTube page and you'll watch last week's story. It was an incredible story. But we got another incredible story to share from someone in our house that we're so grateful for. And we're going to call her Mama Vicky. That's her new name. I'm declaring it now. I'm going to knight you like the Queen of England does. You are now Mama Vicky. There was nothing spiritual about that right there. Just like, is that a thing in the Bible? No, it's not. But we're going to start calling you Mama Vicky. This is Mama Vicky here. And uh, we, I've got to hear your story, and I'm excited about it. And uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, we're in a series called Rescue Stories. And in this series, we celebrate the redemptive work of Jesus by sharing our personal rescue stories. And what I mean by that is this. There's a scripture in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says this. God rescued us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. 
He set us up in the kingdom of the son that he loves so much, the son who got us out of the pit we were in and got rid of the sins that we were doomed to keep repeating. And in this verse, this is the verse that drives this entire series. We want you to know that number one, God rescued us. Number two, we want you to know that he didn't rescue us from just some sweet places, but we were in dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. How many of you have some dark dungeons and dead-end alleys in your life story, right? Been through some rough stuff, okay? And the reason I say that is because I think some people don't think that they're qualified for Jesus to come rescue them. And I want to let you know, if you are broken and busted and disgusted, you are a prime candidate for rescue from Jesus. Now, it's, it didn't say that he just rescued us and got us out, but it said he set us up in the kingdom of the son that he loves so much. Now, he put us in a righteous, royal place. Isn't that good to know that God got me out of the mud, but he didn't keep me near the mud? He literally put me in a royal, righteous position. The Bible says we're a royal priesthood. And then it says this. It says that he, he, he set us up in his kingdom, the son who got us out of the pit we were in, and I love this part, and got rid of the sins that we were doomed to keep repeating. So it isn't just enough for God to rescue us, but then God delivers us and sets us free. Anybody know what? Anybody ever experienced that? Right? He'll set you free. He'll break the chains in your life. And that's what we're celebrating. And today, as I shared, we have Mama Vicky with us and she's got an incredible story. And I promise I'd help you with that. Awesome. She, you got it. You, did, you didn't need me. God is here. <laughs> and and um, she has an incredible story that we've been able to hear. Uh, but to kind of set it up, I want them to know it's not just a one and done rescue story for you. But this story is one where God rescued you, saved you. And then in the middle of a crisis of faith, in the middle of the most maybe tragic moment in your life, he came and rescued you again. So I can't wait to get into this. So before we get into the, the tension, before we get into the meat, how about you tell us a little bit about how you came to Jesus and how he rescued you there? Um, I was brought up in this area. Um, as a small child, something happened to me that kind of traumatized me. And I was always kind of scared to talk to people and just, I'd hide when people would come to my house. I found out at a very young age, if I drank alcohol, I could talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and. And I did. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a way to start. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, alcohol never stays there. And before you know it, I was smoking pot and then I was shooting up. And my life was totally just out of control. And I used to tell myself, like so many addicts do, I can quit anytime I want to. But when I tried, I couldn't. Um, a friend of mine, which I hadn't seen in a couple of years, her name was Karen, she came to visit my mom while I was there, which shocked me because my mom didn't like Karen. It was Karen's fault that her daughter was a drug addict. You know, you always got to blame somebody. <laughs> but they were talking, and Karen was saying how she couldn't pay her fuel bill. Her husband left her. Uh, her car needed inspected, and she was happy. Now, I had a, a pretty good life at that point. I was someone that liked to do uppers. Give me a toothbrush, I'll scrub your floor. You know, I was just really, and then she said to my mom, well, God bless you. And I thought, oh man, she became one of them. But <laughs> she, she left and she put her phone number in my hand. And I thought, I'm gonna call you when pigs fly. You're not preaching to me. But I couldn't get over how peaceful and calm mm. she was with all that trauma in her life. I waited about a week and I couldn't stand it anymore. I went to visit her and I was ready for her. I was drinking all day and smoking pot and I thought she's gonna get it as she starts <laughs> letting me have it too much. <laughs> she had dinner ready. It was peaceful in her house. We talked. She never said a word, which really made me mad. About eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> She said, well, Vicki, I have to put my daughter to bed. Uh, I hope you'll come again. I thought, that's it. So I asked her, I said, Karen, what happened to you? And she said, I met Jesus. 
which at the time I thought that doesn't tell me a whole lot. So she invited me to church the next day. Wasn't sure if I was going to go, but I did. And I don't even know what that man preached about that night. I just knew the whole time he talked, I sat there and cried. Mm. And he did an altar call. And I just, I don't even know how, I just found myself at the front. And I was on my knees. And I was saying, if you can help me, if you're real, and you can help me, then please help me. You know, I left that church and I never did drugs or alcohol after that, <laughs> ever, ever. Praise God. And that began, my walk with the Lord started there. It's so incredible. So, wow, just a, a deliverance story. And I love how you talk the story. <laughs> Your friend, such an awesome witness, uh, wasn't overbearing, <laughs> uh, didn't have to beat Jesus into you, but simply lived the life that was so attractive to you. I love how you said there was peace in her home. She showed me Jesus. So good. Yeah. So good. So you're, 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 you're off to the races. You're, 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 you're one of them. Yes, I'm one of them now. <laughs> I was going to make that you know, clear that you're one of them yes, now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> one of those people. One of those people. <laughs> and you're walking out your faith mm -hmm. in God. And tell us a little bit about next phase. And I, and I share this because... This is where we talk about there's a dual rescue story, mm -hmm. a double. Yeah. So if you could take us into the tension. Well, um, I was in head of the youth for 15 years. I mean, they were my heart, and they were the 12 to 18-year-olds. My children were very involved, of course. And we encouraged them, like when they would go out, like if they met somebody that really needed help, bring them home. Let's bring them, because they came to my house. You know, we had a pool and we played games and we did lots of things there. So I thought, well, just start to love them. Just start to love them. Well, May came home. That's my daughter who died. May came home from the Quarryville Fair with Mike. And it didn't take me long to realize this guy was really having some serious trouble. But I thought, just walk in love. Just try to love him. Show him who Jesus is like Karen did. I knew it, I noticed that if May would come out of the bedroom with like a sweater on, he'd say, you look so good. Please don't wear that. Do you know how much I love you? I will be insanely jealous if a guy would look at you in that. And so he started telling her what to wear. I didn't understand domestic violence at the time, but that's how it starts. Then when all the kids would go out to the pool or they'd be playing taboo, Whatever they were doing, if Mike was there, he would say, just come into the den with me. You're just so beautiful. I just want to spend time with you and look at you. What 17-year-old girl don't want to hear that? <laughs> so she would stay inside. The other kids are starting to get a little mad because there they were, her friends, for quite a while, and she's in there with him. Things got worse as I realized he was doing drugs, and I confronted her about that. And I just said, look, this isn't good. He's telling you what to wear. He's telling you where to go. I don't want him here anymore. So May ran away. I knew where she went. So we had the police bring her back home. He told me, the police officer told me, she was, almost, she was 17, almost 18. He said, if she keeps running away and we have to keep going to get her, we'll put her in... I guess it's still Barnes Hall, like where they put the youth when they're not listening. I didn't want that. And my mom lived right next door. So I said, okay, she can stay with my mother. Things weren't good with May and I. Um, my mom took her, and mom loved Mike. She thought Mike was wonderful. Because he did have his charming side. See, that's what people don't understand about abuse. They see all this abuse, and they think, why do they keep going back? They don't see the flowers and the roses mm. that they get. The candy and the perfume. Oh, and the words. Do you know how much I love you? Do you see what I do? You, I just love you so much. Mm. And all of a sudden, it's love that got the beaten for the girl. So she wasn't in my home. I kept praying. And I was hearing that she was having black eyes. See, domestic violence doesn't stay here. It always escalates. Mm. And so now he's not just only controlling her and isolating her. 
he's starting to smack her around a little bit. Mm-hmm. One night she called her dad. She was crying. It was like 11 o'clock at night. Her and Mike had gotten in a fight. Uh, Mike slammed her face into the steering wheel. She had a big lip. He slammed her hand in the car door, and she was scared. I mean, he took her keys and threw them. By the time my husband got there, he was gone, and she was in the car just crying. And she realized, I think at that point, she couldn't keep going through that. But of course, Mike, may I know we can't be together, but you're the only one that can help me. And once you help me, then we can be together. And, you know, I kept trying to tell her, May, that's not how this works. So she left work one night and uh, she went down to his house, which I'd really told her not to do, but she was there 20 minutes and he shot her in the head twice. And he. It's okay. We got that call that no parent wants to get. Your daughter's been shot. You need to get to the hospital. But that's all they told us. I'm thinking, oh, what if it's in her stomach? Or what if he crippled her? I never saw her getting shot in the head. But when I got there, I just fell on the floor. Like, I couldn't stand up. I kept falling. Um, They didn't let me see her right away. She was alive. My daughter was alive. And I went to see her, and they had her up in the room. Excuse me. And I just was on that floor. I was praying, God, don't you let my little girl die. Don't you let her die. And I thought, you do anything you want to me. You poke my eyeballs out, rip my skin off. But don't you let her die. Because what I was feeling at that point was bad enough. But I thought, what if she dies? And then I thought, we're going to have a Lazarus moment. You know, Jesus got Lazarus out. She was still alive, and my girl was going to get up off that bed. But that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't God's plan. Um, I was in that room with her for four hours, and then she died. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, again, your, just your courage and your willingness to share this story with us. And um, as you shared before, it's the unthinkable for a parent to have to watch your kids suffer and to pass before you. Yes. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine the, the pain, the heartache. But if you would, for just a moment, um, take us into, you're hurting because your daughter's gone. But what does it do to your, to your, your faith? Because you ask God to do something, right? It's like, yeah, why I, wouldn't he step in? Exactly. Um, I just got to a place, I wish I write, and I just kept saying to the Lord, help me write down what that was like. But there aren't words. I can't explain what that was like. There were times when I couldn't breathe, and my my daughter, she'd say, get mom a bag, she can't breathe. Um, The nightmares, I just saw her in a fetal position, and Mike circling her. And how long did she beg for her life before he finally killed her? And I thought, Lord, you can't even give me sleep. My daughter's dead. I can't breathe most of the time. I can't sleep. So, God, are you serious? I just lost all my faith. Lost all my faith. Um, For 30-some years, I'd gotten up every morning, put on worship tapes, read my Bible. I mean... It was a habit that I just, so I kept doing it. And I used to sit in there listening to them worship tapes and think, this is stupid, Mm. and reading the Bible and praying. And I thought, there isn't even anybody that's listening to me. I mean, he was just gone. But I had started a church in my home, and I was in head of the youth, so I just kept doing that. When Pastor Moran couldn't preach, I would preach for him. And the whole time, I didn't believe. Mm. I did not believe, but I didn't know what else to do. And I'm sure you all know, when you walk in this for so long and God's gone, you just keep doing what you know. Mm, so good. But I didn't believe it all. I didn't believe it all. <laughs> you, I mean, you bring up so much with that. Is We, we kind of just do what we've always done, almost mm-hmm. like we're programmed. Yeah. Uh, and you're, you're doing <laughs> spiritual activities, but there's no, there's no spiritual Anything, connection connection to the Lord. Dark, just dark and darkness all the time. Again, I just can't, I keep saying thank you for your honesty, but because 
this is hard to find in the church. <laughs> a lot of times, moments like this, people, all, we love to tell the good part of the story. Yeah. You know, the story that says we overcame, and that, which is really important. Uh, but it's often this part of the story that I think gets missed. And this is why in our conversations prior to this, I said, mm-hmm. hey, I want you to sit in that space because there's somebody out there that came to church and they're literally listening to you and I talk and they're feeling everything that you're feel that you, you're speaking about. That's my prayer. I can help. If one person or one girl lives because my girl died, then it wasn't in vain. I always thought that May's life was going to impact people so much because the kids just kind of followed her around. And I was excited to see what May's life was going to be. And I always thought people would be impacted because she lived. And God always knew it was going to be because she died. (laughs) The word says... If a wheat, a kernel of wheat falls to the ground but doesn't die, it's just one seed. But if the kernel falls down and it dies, it produces many more seeds. And I'm believing that what's my little girl's doing. Yeah, that's She's, good. Thank you. Thank you. So you're numb for a period of time. Uh, and we don't have to put a timetable on it, but <laughs> you're numb for as long as you need to be numb. And uh, what's, paint a picture of, of what that, that second rescue looks like. Mm. Well, for one thing that I didn't realize till after I was through it, God is not just somebody I love and, and I worship. God is my life. Like, it's the reason I dress the way I do, talk the way I do, love the way I do, serve the way I do. So when I took him out of the picture, there was no meaning in life. No meaning in life. And so I started to think, well, even if it's a lie, at least I had hope. And so I thought, I'll just start to believe. (laughs) I didn't know how I was going to do that. But then God took me back and showed me right there. Do you see what happened to you when you were a little girl? I got you through that. Remember at the altar where I delivered you from drugs and alcohol? I did that for you. (laughs) Remember the messes in your marriage and the heartache with your children, and nobody could help you, but I did. And I realized God doesn't waste a tear, a heartache. He doesn't waste nothing. (laughs) It's so good. See, he knew right there, right there, your daughter's going to die. And you don't get what this is all about. But see, he was building a living edifice in me. And he knew up there I was going to need everything, everything that he had put me through. And he was there. And I realized he is real. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Come on. And I just started coming back to real worship time with him and actually praying and knowing that I had a God. And... The nightmares, even those I realized it was his blessing. I ran into a girl later who had lost a child. She literally did not get out of bed for six months. Her husband had to bring food to her, force her into the shower every now and then. See, God wasn't going to let that happen to me. My nightmares kept me going because I was afraid to be asleep and I hurt too bad to be awake. Mm. But he used that. Even that I could praise him for. Um, The night that May died, I prayed that he would just let me die. But what I realized, my prayer was, let me go home to glory and peace and paradise. And you let my little girl here to do this. I'm glad if one of us is here doing this. I'm glad it's me. And I'm glad she is where she is. I never go to May's grave, ever. She's not in there. Um, My family (laughs) does. So that upsets the family, sometimes my mom especially, but, um, oh, it'll make you feel better. No, it won't. My little girl's in heaven, Mm -hmm. and that's where I see her. I don't want to go to a grave where there's what was left of my daughter's old body. It just reminds me of my loss, but my little girl's in heaven, and I thank God for that. So Um, good. So even with all that being said, I also realized that I needed to tell her story. The night she died, I promised her, if you die, 
If you die, I will tell your story and I will be your voice. And I worked for domestic violence for four years. Um, went into a lot of schools, scared to death. I was telling pastor before um, I went to Penn State, that was my first college. And they had 200 kids in that room. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And then there was like no table. And I was like, you really got to get me something here because I can't even read. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as I did that, and I think that was healing for a while, but after a while, it was just like living her death over and over mm. and over. And God waited and he knew I was ready. And he said, you tell her story, but you be my voice. Mm. You be my voice. You tell people how faithful I am. Mm. You tell them. Go ahead. Another thing that helped me come out of that whole mess was, and I've done this a lot in my life, when things are going on, we focus so much on the pain and, and what's going wrong. And I had so many blessings right in front of me. He said, look at those babies you do have. Yeah. Look at the grandchildren you do have. That's right. People all around you. And so I would be forced to, when I got in those really heavy, deep moments, to think, okay, Lord, thank you for my kids. Thank you for my home. Thank you that you've getting me through this. Thank yeah. you that you brought me back. Yeah. And people, when May first died, they'd say, hang on to Jesus. You know, of course, no, I don't believe. I'm saying, okay. <laughs> 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 but God showed me too, when you can't hang on to him, when there's nothing left in you, he never left me go. Mm. Never left me go. So awesome. And uh, we want to take a moment to acknowledge some of your family yeah. members who are here. Can you give my a hand? My daughter Becca, and we got two of my grandchildren. I actually have 20 grandchildren and 11 great grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Linda came and her little group there. We grew up together. We were hitting each other over the head with milk bottles when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yeah. all for, uh, for being here with us. And we're not done yet because I think that there is, uh, you know, when you go through something like this and you experience all of this, that God fills your, your vessel with oil. Yes. And I believe that oil is what's used to pour into other people's lives. Yeah. So that as they're navigating and going through the challenges and all the struggles that someone can point them to Jesus. So uh, what advice would you give to the person, and we'll, we'll take this two ways, one to the person who's in that numb crisis of faith, they know Jesus, but they're going through something that has them questioning everything. And then the other one is what would you get, what advice would you give to the family or the individual who's dealing with issues of domestic violence right now? First of all, I think everybody's walk's different, but I would just say in any way that you can, and I don't even know how to tell you that because it's such a dark place, but somewhere in the back of your mind, just remember God's there. You don't have to hang on. He's got you. <laughs> there's a song um, that came out along. I'm a song person. Uh, it was called The Climb, and it said there's always going to be another mountain, and you're always going to want to make it move, and it's always going to be an uphill battle, but sometimes you're going to have to lose. But it isn't how fast you get there or what's on the other side. It's the climb. I would get up and I'd think, can I get up? And I'd look back at the pillow and I'd think, no, I guess I'll get up. <laughs> and I would start my day and then I would find myself just flat on the floor crying, just wanting to go back to bed. And Jesus sat there and he waited. See, I fell. When you're ready, girlfriend, we're going to climb. Mm. And we climb, we would. And <laughs> climb, we would. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. So... I just want you to know that Jesus is there, and you don't have to hang on. He's got you, and he's going to climb you right out of that. It's going to take time, <laughs> and, um, but he will. he will. There is hope. There's always hope in Jesus, and he doesn't allow these things to happen for no reason. People used to say to me, I bet you're mad at God. For what? I mean, May was making choices. We have choices. Mm -hmm. And I used to, am I really mad at God? I used to think, well, maybe I am, and I just don't want to admit that. <laughs> but I truly was never mad at God, ever. And I, that's also a blessing that he gave me. There was no anger towards him at all. Mm. Just love after I got yeah. back in his arms, and he just loved me. 
and I just thanked him that he was still there for me. That's so good. So, um, as far as domestic violence, oh baby, that's a whole nother hour of talk, but <laughs> I'll spare you that. For one thing, anybody that's in domestic violence, you have the right to wear anything you want. Don't you let people tell you what to wear. You can hang out with whoever you want to. You can go wherever you want to. Don't let someone tell you, oh, you can't because I love you so much. That's from the pit of hell, smells like smoke. That's nothing but control. <laughs> control and isolation. Um, let me see, there's so much I have to say about this. Um, and Domestic violence, as I said, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. It's good. It, it gets worse. Um, Yolanda Jackson, she was a, a girl I met who worked at the district attorney's office. Her niece was in a, a domestic violence situation, and because she got pregnant, she decided that she was done. And so she left. Um, he asked if he could see her, and he stabbed her 38 times and her baby, and he killed her. Women are in most danger when they try to leave. And for some reason, when they're pregnant, men get really mad about that. I guess because the woman's like showing so much attention to their unborn baby, I'm not sure. Um, so many times when people are in abuse, their families get frustrated because they're getting beat, they're getting out, they're starting their own life and then poof, there they go. Let me just say there is so much more to that that I can't get into. I understand it now. Don't turn your back on that person. Don't say, I'm done with you. If this happens again, go somewhere else. You want to keep going back to that, then you go back to that. Maybe that next time, it'll be for real, and they'll get out of there for real. You don't want that person to know in that horrible time that there's nowhere to go. My family's done with me. My friends don't want anything to do with me. Stand by those people and let them know you're always there for them. Not that you approve. And keep trying to encourage them to get out. Um, I'd like to read you uh, another song uh, that called Concrete Angels. It came out right after May was born and it kind of speaks of exactly um, I think what people need to know, it says she walks to school with a lunch she packed. Nobody knows what she's holding back. Wearing the same dress she wore yesterday, she hides the bruises with the linen and lace. The teacher wonders, but she doesn't ask. It's hard to see all that pain behind the mask. Bearing the burden of a secret storm, and sometimes she wishes she was never born. Through the wind and the rain, she stands hard as a stone in the world that she can't rise above. But her dreams give her wings, and she flies to the place where she's loved, a concrete angel. Somebody cries in the middle of the night. The neighbors hear, but they turn out the lights. A fragile soul caught in the hands of fate, and in the morning it'll be too late. A statue stands in a shaded place, an angel girl with an upturned face. Her name is written on a polished rock, a broken heart that the world forgot. Through the wind and the rain, she stands hard as a stone in a world that she can't rise above. But her wings give her, her dreams give her wings, and she flies to a place where she's loved. My daughter got outside of that house the night he killed her, and the neighbors were there. And he drug her back in the house, and they went to bed. Don't get in the middle of that, for goodness sake. It's dangerous. Call somebody. Call 911. Don't look the other way. Um, that was hard for me to find <laughs> that out. And my little girl's name is on a polished rock. But God willing, she's not going to be anyone the world will forget. Mm -hmm. As long as I have breath in me, I'm going to tell her story and the faithfulness of God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank. That's about all I have to say. I'm faint. Thank you for um, just again being so courageous and uh, just being willing to share not only 
you know, your daughter's story, May's story, but being able to share your story. And because in all of this, many of us are looking at you. And I, I know some, I know right now I am. I'm looking and saying, my God, my problems. You know, I was I was worn out this week over some really itty bitty stuff. Um, but it's a reminder to me um, that God is present even with me. And we spoke about this. You yeah. said that there's no. Can I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a friend of mine's husband died, which was a really weird situation. It was a couple years after May died. He died in the same room she died in on her birthday. <laughs> so it was really, anyway, uh, my friend was talking to me and she was so angry. She said, there's a girl where I work and she's getting divorced and she's boo-hooing and whining. And she said, I wanted to say to her, how would you like to bury your husband? And I thought about that for a minute. And I said, Pam, I understand your pain, but pain's pain. Right. How would you like me to say to you, well, so what, your husband died, I buried my daughter. Don't ever think your pain's lesser than That's somebody right. else's. That's good. Pain's pain, and just be there. Yeah. Don't compare. So good. So good. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure we highlighted that. I know that was a part of our conversation. Yeah, that was and, not. Yeah, and I wanted to highlight that because um, um, I think that when we hear stories like this, uh, it's easy to just, you know, oh, well, that's a whole other category of pain. And the reality is God is present in our pain, whether it's uh, a story that you think is this, that, or the other, and, and that we should also be considerate of each other's pain. Uh, and when we do that, I think we're most like Christ. I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you for being wide open and sharing with us. Uh, you spoke today uh, as a mother who's gone through pain, but you spoke as a spiritual mom too today. I felt some of that when you were talking today. Uh, just, just really, <laughs> just speaking from a place of wisdom and experience, and it is a joy. It's a joy to have you. I'll say this. It's a joy to pastor someone like you, um, to have someone who just who is committed to what you said. So everything you shared today about your, your life and Jesus being your life and serving others being your life, none of that was put on. We get to see that and experience this every single week with you. And uh, our prayer for you is that as you continue to share this story and share the glory and the goodness of God, that people would be impacted by that story. My prayer is that someone out here today, someone watching online right now, um, I believe this Maybe someone in your world that you're going to send this to, uh, and you're going to send them the link, and they're going to watch it, and they're going to hear Jesus. They're going to hear his deep love, his, his concern and care, and it's going to draw them into a stronger relationship with him. I certainly, that's my prayer. That is my prayer. Um, there's nothing in this world that he can't get you through. There's also things that he's going to require of you after he does. You know, it's not just empty tears and crying. There's something that he's going to expect you to do with all that grace and love. Mm, so and good. try to hang on to that, too, when you're going through some stuff. It's not for nothing. God's going to use every bit of it. If you'll let him, you've got to be an emptied out vessel, but he'll use you. And it'll help people. It is so good. Do you all put your hands together and show some love? Come on. I think we can show her a whole lot of love. It takes a lot of courage to share this story today. Can we give a big hand for her family as well as they're here? And come on. Great story. Great testimony. And uh, we're so glad you may be seated for just a moment. I think our team's coming out. Family, if you're watching online, if you're here in the auditorium, and uh, maybe it's not domestic violence. Maybe that's not your issue right now. Maybe that's not the pain that you're experiencing. But it might be that you're having a crisis of faith. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's a financial, whatever it is. We want you to know that God, <laughs> even though you feel numb, and he doesn't feel present, we want you to know that he's with you. You know, and so many times we come to church and we often miss the most basic things that people need. You see, there's this big battle in the world right now about church and whether you need it or not. 
I think the Bible's pretty clear about that, and I'm not going to argue that. But I know what I do need. I need reminders. And I need people in my world who will keep pointing me back to Jesus. I need people that when I am overwhelmed by the cares of life, that will remind me that we serve a faithful God. Last night, my wife was sitting on the side of the bed folding clothes, because that's what you do when you have five boys. You fold clothes and wash them all the time. <laughs> Did I just let that out? Just feel like I never stop washing clothes, y'all. When is it going to end? But she was folding some clothes, and I was pacing. And she said, what's the matter with you? And I was like, I don't know. And she was like, what's on your mind? I don't know. You ever don't know? And there was just this heaviness. And when my wife asked me the question and I couldn't give her the answer, I went down to my prayer closet, which is the basement, <laughs> to probably fold more clothes. <laughs> and I'm in the basement and I'm talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, um, wife is good. Kids are well. Church is well. You know, things in life are pretty well. What's going on? I said, what's this heaviness that I'm feeling? What am I feeling? It wasn't gloom. It wasn't like a personal depression. And I just asked the Lord. And, and, and I just started praying and asking the Lord. And I didn't, I didn't get an, uh, an audible voice from heaven. I didn't hear, son, this is the Lord. You know, I know sometimes we're expecting that, and it's not that. But I just felt this impression on my heart where the Lord said, this is what it is to sit in it with people. We talk about bearing one another's burdens. That's not buying someone a meal. Bearing a burden is sometimes sitting in it, and you feel it. And it may not be yours altogether to bear, but you feel it. And I just began to pray into that yesterday, and that's why I shared with you prior to Mama Vicky sharing her story that I wanted you to know that God is present in the midst of the pain and the, he's present. And I know he doesn't feel present. I know he doesn't feel present. And here's, here's the crazy part about that. It's the same thing Jesus felt in that garden of Gethsemane, that garden where Jesus is praying just before he's about to get arrested and eventually crucified. He's crying out. He's saying, Lord, if this cup could pass, if this cup could pass, but even prior to that, he's like praying in agony. He is feeling forsaken, even though he's not. He's feeling like he's at it alone, even though he's not. And many of us know that the Gethsemane experience. We're, we're living it right now, and it's so crazy that we're going into Passion Week, we're going into Holy Week, where this is all what we're, this is, what we're celebrating, what we're, what we're remembering and memorializing. And I want you just to think about it while you're in your own Gethsemane. I want to remind you that you're not alone. That death can be close. That you can feel like you are being stretched beyond anything you could ever imagine. And you can feel like you're the only one praying. You're the only one for you, but you're not alone. It's exactly what Jesus is experiencing. It's what he's feeling. He brings his three closest friends to come and pray with him. And while he's praying in agony and pain, what are they doing? Sleeping. Just another sign that everything on this side of eternity will fail you. And you'll find yourself in these moments in life where it's only you and him. And then you can't really even see him because you're so overwhelmed by all the pain. And I just want to encourage you in that space. If you would just make this one declaration, not my will, but your will be done. It's maybe the hardest thing you will ever say as a believer. It may be the only thing that actually brings you out of this crisis of faith. But it is not my will, but your will to be done, God. 
God, I want it my way. If I could have it my way, I would let this cup pass me. I wouldn't go through the pain that you're allowing me to go through, God. But this is not my will. It is your will, so your will be done. And what Jesus was saying in all of that was, he said, Father, whatever you choose, I'm going there. And it may mean that I have to bleed. It may mean that I have to have the beard torn from my face. It may mean that I have to walk through the car, through the marketplace completely naked, being mocked and scorned and laughed at, and all the while knowing in my own mind that I did nothing to deserve this. It may mean all of this, but it is not my will, but your will be done. And I pray, I pray, whoever you are in that space, in that pain, in that place where you just feel like I can't take anymore, that you would stop in this moment and just make that declaration, God, not my will, but your will be done. And you, friend, brother, sister, those that are here in person and those that are watching online, you are, the, you are the person that God wants to speak to today. He wants to minister directly to your need, to your pain. He, yeah, yeah, he wants to sit in it with you. And in sitting in it with you, he wants to rescue you. So if all around this auditorium, you would please stand to your feet.